So this is the second upload of the day. We talked about neonatal hypothermia in the previous video. So if you haven't watched that video, head over there. I'll leave it tagged at the end of the video. For now, grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at hypothermia in adults. This is of course the second upload of the day. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Grab a piece of paper and your pen and let's go. Unlike with the Neonates where we define hypothermia as a temperature less than 36.5. Here in adults, we're going to be defining hypothermia as a cold body temperature less than 35 degrees Celsius. Remember that hypothermia can be divided into primary hypothermia and secondary hypothermia. Well, with primary hypothermia being largely underreported and largely being classified into uh, three main groups. You have what is known as accidental, which is the most common, homicidal, where someone decides to kill you, or suicidal, where you decide to kill yourself. Then you may have secondary hypothermia, which is also significant and under-recognized. It may be one of the causes of mortality, especially because there is an increased risk of cardiovascular and neurological disorders. What are some of the causes? Remember that most of the hypothermia is going to be in the background of conditions that are going to be decreasing your level of consciousness such that you're unable to tell that you're cold and have these preventive measures. There's some level of immobility or even both. So for example, it could be in the background of trauma, hypoglycemia, seizure disorders, stroke, drug or alcohol intoxication. All these are common predisposing factors. Then remember also that you may get cold weather or immersion in cold water. However, in warmer climates, when people lie immobile on a cooler surface, for example, like those that I say that, that are intoxicated or those that have sustained trauma and can't really move. Then after a very long prolonged immersion of swimming at temperatures of about 20 to 24 degrees, remember that if someone has wet clothes on and wind, it actually increases the risk of hypothermia. Another thing to note is that hypothermia is actually much, much more common in older patients as well as very young patients. Why is this so? Remember that in older patients, there is a decrease in them being able to sense these temperature variations. There is impaired mobility and communication. And also this is going to be resulting in this tendency of these older individuals remaining in this cooler environment. And also as the older you get, there is a, a diminished subcutaneous fat that insulates your body and keeps you warm. So this actually also does contribute to hypothermia hypothermia such that if you get an older patient that may even in be in a cooler room indoor they may still be hypothermic then with the very young this actually have a decreased mobility and communication they're not able to tell you that they're feeling cold and there is an increase in surface area to body ratio so this actually increases the heat losses so how do we classify hypothermia this can be classified according to severity based on the wilderness medical society clinical practice guidelines Mild hypothermia is a temperature between 32 to 35 degrees Celsius. Moderate hypothermia is between 28 to 32 degrees Celsius. And severe hypothermia is any temperature that is less than 28 degrees Celsius. Now remember that hypothermia is going to be slowing down all the physiological processes in the body. It's going to be slowing down enzymes. It's going to be slowing down the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, nerve conduction, mental acuity, the reaction time, and even metabolic rates. And remember that these thermoregulation, which is going to be happening in the body, counter-regulatory mechanisms that are meant to actually prevent your temperature from falling, things like shivering, contraction of the erector pillar muscles, so that you can actually cause those goosebumps and those hairs can stand up to trap air to insulate you although this has some minimal effect it's much more evident in animals that actually have a lot of fur so this thermoregulation actually ceases below the temperatures of 30 degrees celsius so the body must actually depend on external heat as a purpose of rewarming itself and remember when it's cold you have this renal cell dysfunction you have a decrease in the production of adh antidiuretic hormone also known as vasopressin this may lead to this production of large amounts of dilute urine, what we refer to as cold diuresis. Now remember that this 
the diuresis together with this fluid leakage into the interstitium is what's going to cause hypovolemia. But in the interim, this may actually not be very evident. Why is this so? Because remember, whenever there's cold, there's this vasoconstrictory effect that happens in order to shunt blood to the vital organs. So this vasoconstrictory effect may actually initially mask the hypovolemia such that whenever you now begin to rewarm this patient, especially if you rewarm the extremities first, they may actually damp all this volume into the bloodstream and they increase the workload on the heart on a heart that was already reduced in activity by the coldness and this can actually result in sudden shock or even sudden cardiac arrest something that we refer to as rewarming collapse and remember that in infants or rather in individuals that are immersed in cold water this can actually trigger what we refer to as the diving reflex remember this is just this reflex constriction of the visceral uh, blood vessel muscles and blood is being shunted to the essential organs the heart and the brain so this reflex is actually much more pronounced in children and it's actually a protective mechanism so remember that hypothermia Actually, even when you immerse in near freezing water can actually have a protective function of the brain from hypoxia because it actually decreases the metabolic demands. There's something that we call therapeutic hypothermia, which we use in babies that actually have hypoxic, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And of course, the decrease in demand uh, probably is what's going to be accounting for the occasional survival after prolonged cardiac arrest due to extreme hypothermia. So what are some of the clinical features? You get this intense shivering, which you may not see in neonates. So this happens and when the temperatures are below 30, it actually stops. And this allows the body temperature to keep dropping very quickly. You may get this central nervous system dysfunction as the temperatures decrease. So people are not going to be able to sense the cold. They may become lethargic. They may be uh, clumsy. They may become confused they may have this irritability eventually they'll start hallucinating and they'll slip into a coma when you examine them the pupils may not even be reactive the respirations and the heart rate are going to be slow and ultimately the heart may even stop so if you actually connect an ecg to this patient you may initially have a sinus bradycardia that later is followed by a slow atrial fibrillation then eventually the rhythm that you get before this patient demises would either be a ventricular fibrillation or a systole so how do you make a diagnosis of hypothermia? Remember, you want to get a core temperature measurement. You should consider other conditions such as intoxication, myxedema, which is a severe type of hypothyroidism, sepsis, hypoglycemia, and even trauma. Remember that the diagnosis is going to be a temperature, a core body temperature less than 35 degrees Celsius. And remember, we want to prefer the electronic thermometers as opposed to the mercury ones because the mercury ones do not go below the lower limit of 34 degrees Celsius. If you want the most accurate readings, make sure you put your, your, your probes in the rectal or esophageal area. What tests may you want to consider? A full blood count and a glucose measurement. You should do also a bedside random blood glucose as estimate. The electrolytes, blood, urea, and creatinine, arterial blood gases. Remember, we do not correct the arterial blood gases because of the low temperature. There's no correction that is needed. And an ECG. So when you do an ECG, you're going to be seeing what are known as J waves. It's very now. Now, here's a very important thing. J waves, it's very difficult to distinguish this from the myocardial infarction. So you must use your clinical context to actually see what when this ECG was taken and what were the what's the clinical history behind this patient because you may think it's a myocardial infarction so you may get this osborne waves which are the j waves in v4 and you may get this interval prolongation of the pr the qrs complex and even the qt interval and of course if the cause of hypothermia is not so clear you should actually tease out these contributing factors you measure the level of alcohol you screen for any drugs you do your thyroid function tests if there's sepsis or even there is any blunt trauma or coat head or skull a skeletal trauma, you should consider these things. Hypoadrenalism and even hypothyroidism, including myxedema, which is a severe form, must be tested must be tested for. And often this is going to be evident where there is no history of code intolerance. This person has dry skin, they may have arthralgias, they may have lassitude. And of course, the clue that's going to be there is that there'll be failure to rewarm. And of course, myxedema is characteristically going to be giving you a prolonged relaxation phase of the ankle reflex. And, is, uh, and it's more than the contraction phase of this um, uh, reflex. 
then this is what the ECG looks like. So you get these J waves, which are visible as you see them as a hump, as you can see here, these J waves that you can see in lead V4, it becomes prominent. And of course, they're going to be found at the junction of the QRS complex and the ST segment. So remember these computer programs that actually print out these ECGs I have a difficult time differentiating between hypothermia and myocardial injury current. So how do we manage or what do we treat? So remember, we want to dry this patient and insulate them. We want to give them fluid resuscitation because there is that fluid loss due to the cold diuresis that's happening. Fluid is being lost into the interstitium. So you want to replace this volume. You want to actively rewarm them unless if the hypothermia is mild, accidental or uncomplicated. So remember, the first priority is to prevent them from having this further heat loss. So you want to remove any cold uh, or wet clothing. You want to... Um, remove them from the heat from the window rather you want if they're immersed in water remove them from the water insulate the patient so give them dry clothes then subsequent measure going to depend on largely the severity of the hypothermia or whether they have cardiovascular instability or cardiac arrest where their heart has stopped so returning the patient to the normal temperature is actually less urgent when you get a patient that's mild hypothermia so you want to return it slowly as compared to someone with severe hypothermia we want to return it very quickly for those that are stable actually you can actually increase the temperature by about one degree celsius per hour remember these patients are going to be hypovolemic and you want to replace the fluid so fluid resuscitation very important so we give them about 500 mils to about two liters of normal saline and then in children it can be about 20 mils per kg so if possible, you should heat the solutions to about 40 to 42 degrees. And then, of course, the more fluids are going to be given as you need to maintain the perfusion. So there are two types of warming. There's what we call passive rewarming and what we call active rewarming. So in passive rewarming, this is done, for, for example, in patients that have mild hypothermia. So how would you know that there's mild hypothermia? There's going to be shivering. Remember, shivering stops when the temperature falls below 30 degrees Celsius. So there's an intact thermoregulatory um, balance here, thermoregulatory mechanisms. So you insulate them with the heated blankets and give them warm fluids to drink, and this may be adequate. But for those that actually have moderate to severe hypothermia, active rewarming is actually needed. So those that have a temperature less than 32 degrees Celsius, those that have cardiovascular instability, hormone insufficiency in the background of hypoadrenalism and even hypothyroidism, or hypothermia that's secondary to trauma, toxins, or predisposing disorders, you want to actively rewarm them. So in moderate hypothermia, Hypothermia, the body temperature is at the warmer end of the range, so that's around 28 to 32. So, external rewarming with uh, forced hot air enclosures may actually be needed. And remember, this external heat must be applied to the chest first, the thorax. The reason being, if you rewarm the peripheries, you cause that vasodilatation, that blood volume will return into the cardiovascular system and you may put strain on the heart and result in that rewarming collapse. So you want to rewarm the thorax fast, first, then you rewarm the extremities. As this rewarming the extremities first can increase the metabolic demands on a depressed cardiovascular system. So in severe hypothermia, the patients with a lower temperature less than 28 degrees Celsius, then these actually those that have low blood pressure or even cardiac arrest these are going to require what we call core rewarming the different options of core rewarming that you may consider and these include inhalation you may have iv infusion you may have lavage you may also have extracorporeal core rewarming so with the inhalation it's very easy just simply heat up the oxygen to 40 to 45 degrees, give them humidified oxygen via a mask or endotracheal tube. Of course, this is going to eliminate the heat that is lost to the respiratory system and furthermore add the temperature of about one to two degrees Celsius to the rewarming rate. When you're giving the IV fluids as crystalloids or even blood, you rewarm it to about 40 to 42 degrees, especially if you're actually having this massive volume resuscitations. When you have a lavage systems, you may have what is known as a closed thoracic lavage, where you actually place two thoracostomy tubes, one that will pump in a fluid, one that pumps it out, and this fluid is rewarming this patient. Sometimes you may do this in the peritoneal lavage with a dialysis set heated to about 40 to 45 degrees Celsius with two catheters with an outflow suction, and uh, this is very useful for those that are severely hypothermic patients, those that have rhabdomyolysis, toxic ingestion, and even electrolyte abnormalities because it's going to be killing two birds with 
one stone. Then you may get heated lavage of the bladder in the gastrointestinal tract, and this actually sometimes transfers, or actually more or less transfers many more heat compared to the other two modalities. Then you may have extracorporeal core rewarming techniques, which are five. Of course, I want to go into details much of this because we rarely do them. They require specialists, they require certain protocols to be done, although these are quite attractive and they have this heroic thing to save the patient, they're not routinely done in most hospitals. But they include things like hemodialysis, uh, venovenous, continuous atrovenous, cardiopulmonary bypass, and even extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which are some of the things that can be done to rewarm the patient. Now, there is the last thing that I'll talk about, or second last thing, is cardiopulmonary respiration, because remember, there's a risk of uh, asystole in this patient, there's a risk of hypotension, there's a risk of bradycardia. So remember that patients that are hypothermic are at risk of hypotension and bradycardia. We do not need to aggressively treat these things if they're caused by the hypothermia. Merely just rewarming the patient will be enough to correct these things. But whenever needed, you can actually place an endotracheal tube and intubate them, but you must do this gently because you may actually precipitate an arrhythmia. So only reserve the CPR, the chest compression, if the patient has truly cardiac arrest. If the heart has stopped, that's when you can actually start the chest compressions. And how would you know this? There's absence of cardiac motion on the bedside cardiac ultrasonography. If you have a continuous ECG monitor, you can actually consider this connected. But of course, it's going to be not so accurate because this person is already hypothermic. Then... We want to de depend mostly on the cardiac ultrasonography. So we then treat them with fluids. We actively rewarm the hypothermia. And of course, the core temperature is going to be stabilized before we actually rewarm the extremities. This is going to prevent this rewarming collapse. And of course, chest compressions are not routinely done because once you do the chest compressions, you may actually convert a perfusable rhythm to a non-perfusable rhythm. So you may convert, you may actually precipitate an arrhythmia. You may precipitate a, a, a systole. You may precipitate a ventricular uh, fibrillation. Now, of course, these patients that often have these non-perfusing rhythms like ventricular fibrillation and asystole may require CPR. So your chest compression and endotracheal tube intubation can be done. Defibrillation is actually very, very difficult, especially if the temperatures are very low. So we often tend to wait until the temperatures are greater than 30 degrees, but usually we may actually give them one attempt of a very high um, voltage setting for the defibrillator, about 200 joules or for biphasic and 360 for monophasic. Then for the advanced cardiac life support drugs, such as the antiarrhythmics, the vasopressors, ionotropes. These ones also we don't give them until the temperature has been above 30 uh, degrees Celsius. But of course, we can reserve those that are severely hypotensive and those that are not responding to fluid therapy. We can actually give them low dose dopamine, one to five micrograms per kg per minute or other catecholamines to actually bring up the BP. But remember that the advanced life support should be continued until the temperature reaches 32 degrees Celsius or unless if otherwise lethal injuries or other disorders are present. Remember, if you have severe hyperkalemia, uh, concentration of potassium greater than 12 millimoles per liter, during the resuscitation, this is going to be indicating a fatal outcome, and actually this can guide the resuscitation efforts. So what's the prognosis? Remember that patients that have been immersed in icy water for one hour or more sometimes are going to be successfully resuscitated and rewarmed without actually having any permanent brain damage. For example, those that have drowned. So even though the core temperature may be very low, even the pupils become unreactive, we have actually saved such patients. But of course, the outcome is, not, is very difficult to predict. And even the GCS cannot be used to predict the outcome of a patient that has hypothermia. But if you see any of the following things, these are usually bad prognostic indicators. So if you see any evidence of cellular lysis, such as a serum potassium that's greater than 12, or intravascular thrombosis, a fibrinogen level that's less than 1.47 micromoles or 50 milligrams per deciliter, and a non-perfusion cardiac rhythm, for example, ventricular fibrillation or asystole, all these are bad markers, bad prognostic markers. So for a given degree or in duration of hypothermia, remember always that children are actually likely, more likely or have a greater chance of survival from hypothermia than do adults. I really hope you enjoyed this video on hypothermia. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Until next time, my name is Dr. Moses Kasevu. Bye-bye.